That's dramatic, isn't it? Okay. Um, hey, those of y'all that are new, my name's Tom, uh, one of the preaching guys here. How we study the Bible is we try to keep it super simple. If you're new, we're not going to try to wow you because we're not that impressive. But the Word of God is super impressive. So what we want to do is we want to give you as much Scripture as we can. Uh, we're going to start the, 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 the sermon with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to pray that together, have you stand up in a minute. And then we're going to finish the sermon today with the doxology. How many of y'all were raised singing the doxology? Some of y'all are like, that's a weird word. I don't even know what you're talking about. Is this a cult? No, it's uh, we're Jesus lovers. Um, here's the focus of Scripture. Scripture uh, adores God. Okay, Christians are called to adore God, to have adoration. What we lean into more than anything is we bring our giant list of needs to God all the time, and we, we, we displace. We say, um, what you really need to hear from me, God, is my list. And what Matthew 6 says is, I know all about your list. Worship me. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness all these things will be added to you. The things that God wants you to have, they'll be added. So the thing that we can do, like literally today, we could not prayer, pray all of our petitions to God and he will answer them. What you are commanded to do today, and I am commanded to do today, is to worship him. Those, were, those are what uh, adoration does. Um, Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are mighty. Lord, you are the only one that can forgive my sin and redeem me from the responsibility of that sin. Lord, you're the only one that knows my tomorrow and can answer me right now in my need. Lord, you're the only one that shows me continual mercy. These are statements of adoration. So what you'll see in the Lord's Prayer as we pray that together in a minute is Jesus, Matthew 6, opens up with adoration to his Father, and then he allows us petition, which is not a bad thing. Like uh, those of us that have kids, we want our kids to be able to say, Dad, I need something. Dad, I want something. My oldest would always say this. Dad, name's Carolina. And I would say, yes. And she would say, I love you. That was the beginning of the pitch. <laughs> and I would say, I love you too. She would say, can we get some popsicles and go to the pool? And I would say, yes, we can. That's a good request. Okay? So sometimes uh, parents have to say no, not because they don't love their kids, but because they love their kids. All right? And so in our petitions, they're good. God has given you the right and me the right to petition, but he already knows your needs. What we can way maximize right now is our worship, our declaration, our prayer, of who he is. So stand with me. We're going we're gonna to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Um, this is an old prayer. It's a timeless prayer. It's a prayer of worship. Pray with me out loud. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the word of God. You may be seated. So as we're, we're praying that prayer, did you hear the standard did you hear the standard? Um, we will see today non-following people respond the right way. We'll see uh, some witchcraft call people to do the right thing. But did you see, did you hear the standard in the prayer? The standard is not your cultural norm. The standard is not what you think is right. The standard is not your political background. The standard is the holiness of God. And it's never changed. 
It's been that way for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Since the beginning of time, since Genesis, when the world was created, the standard has been God's holiness and God's power and God's will. And this is where we're called to be. So here's the intro. We'll be 1 Samuel chapter 6 today. Um, Pastor Daniel pro- preached uh, 1 Samuel 5 uh, last week. The theme of that, and you can get it on our website if you need it, was God will not be used or taken advantage of, and God's will is going to be done no matter what. You can't stop it. You can't thwart it, okay? Um, 1 Samuel 6, verse 1. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll go right into the message for today. Uh, Lord, you Christians are here. Your people that you've saved, called, sealed, uh, and they're struggling, Lord, with sin, with issues, with repentance. And there are non-Christians here that you may be calling right now. You, you may be wooing uh, with your kindness, Lord. And that's your kindness brings us to repentance. And so we want to, we want to stop doing certain things, Lord, that we struggle with. We want to learn how to confess better. Because confession is worship, and we want to learn how to worship you. And worship is not just singing a song. That's a part of it. But worship is adoration, adoring you, O God, and looking upon you and saying, you are the standard. You are the one that will not be broken. You are the one that must be obeyed. So, Lord, speak to us uh, through this crazy story today. And all God's people said, Amen. Okay, verse 1, chapter 6. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory for seven months, the Philistines summoned the priests and the diviners. The diviners, these were the witches. These were the occult people, okay? Um, They are asking the best of their spiritual uh, advisors what they should be doing. Why? Well, because um, basically a form of like bubonic plague had broken out. Tumors were killing people. Rats were spreading disease and infestation. And it had begun when the Ark of God came into the land of Philistia. Now, there's basically five areas of division. You're going to see the five leaders of these states or boroughs, if you will, come into the story in a little bit. So they, they brought the Ark of the Covenant into Ashdod. They put it before Dagon, their merman uh, god who fell in front of the Ark. Kind of a little bit of a weird thing there. Um, Merman is what he what he was. I think SpongeBob SquarePants. When I think of you know the half fish, half. Some of y'all don't watch Square Bob, SpongeBob because you may think it's bad, but it's really pretty funny. Um, <laughs> something to look into later. So they bring in the Ark of the Covenant in front of Dagon, the half fish guy, and they come back in the morning, and the whole idol has fallen in front of the Ark. I got. And so they're like, obviously, it was a mistake. Something happened. And so they place him back up. And the next morning, they come in, and his hands are broken off, and his head is broken off. What's interesting about that, in this space in the world at that time, this is what they would do to kings when they conquered them. They would cut off their head. They would cut off their hands. Okay? Violent people. And now this idol they worshiped, which was just, you know, just an idol, uh, is broken before the representative or the, the, the ark of God. Uh, their idol fell at the feet of the ark, heads and hands broken. Um, here's a quote from Phil Long, uh, a theology guy. Here's what he said. Daniel did this last week. The Philistines had thought their God to have the upper hand over Israel's, but they now find him both headless and handless, and they themselves will soon be feeling in their own bodies the heavy hand of Yahweh. Listen, We don't have to concern ourselves with anxiety in the world we live in today. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Every governmental leader, every superstar, every rock star, every person of influence, no matter, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the only Lord. Every knee will bow, okay? Um, Men of Ashdod start having tumors what scripture records is not only uh, the older men, but the younger men. Imagine your little kids coming down with these tumors. They move the ark to Gath, which is just a, a, another lovely city name, right? Where do you live? Gath. Men begin having tumors there. 
ark was moved to Ekron. Uh, and 511, the chapter before, implies that people were not only getting tumors, but dying in each city. So there's a scourge. There's a problem that's happening. And the Philistines probably denied it for a while, as many of us do. When issues arise, we tend to go, ah, oh, that's not really, it doesn't have to do with me. And then it gets closer and affects our families deeper and becomes a problem. Verse 3, they replied, these diviners, the witches basically, they replied, if you send the ark of Israel's God away, do not send it without an offering. Send back a guilt offering to him and you will be healed. Then the reason his hand hasn't been removed from you will be revealed. They asked, what guilt offering should we send back to this God, to, to uh, Jehovah God? And they answered, five gold tumors and five gold mice corresponding to the number of Philistine rulers, since there was one plague for both of you and your rulers. Uh, the Philistines understood offerings. They gave offerings all the time. Some of them uh, literally gave their children to be offerings, burnt offerings, worshiping who they thought was a God. Now, here's the deal. There are no other gods but the God. That name is assigned to only one being, and that is Jehovah God. Who they were worshiping were demons, created beings who masqueraded and lied and acted uh, as God. Uh, tumors are killing people in every town. Mice, which spread sickness and disease, mentioned in 1 Samuel 5, 6. Uh, not added in all translations, but we see the relevance. Verse 5, here's what the diviners say. Make images of your tumors and of your mice that are destroying the land. Give glory, and here's, look, if, if you're new to the Christian game, the beauty of the Bible is that it is living and breathing, okay? Uh, it is a powerful thing, and when you study it, uh, those of us that have been studying the Bible for a while, you'll study the same passage and see two or three things, and then you will study the passage again, and your response is like, oh my gosh, what about that? I haven't noticed that before. I've read this book many, many times. Here's what it says latter part of verse 5. These are a cult, a cult people telling their people what to do. Give glory to Israel's God, and perhaps he will stop oppressing you, your gods and your land. They don't give up the fact that they think they have gods. They're just recognizing the fact that this God we're dealing with is greater than the gods we have. Why harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened theirs. They knew the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. When he afflicted them, didn't they send Israel away and Israel left? So this blew me away as I'm studying that and studying some commentaries. These pagans tell other pagans to do three things. What is it? First one, stop your sin. Stop. Second one is this, confess the sin. And the third one is what? Worship God. This is the calling. Stop your sin. Confess your sin. Worship God. I think a lot of us believe that worship should happen when we've had a long run of doing everything right. Then we can worship God. We can sing and we can declare our love for our Savior. Isn't the best time to worship your Savior when you're being saved? And non-Christians are saved by Jesus all the time. I, as a believer of 20 plus years, I feel like I'm pulled out of the hole all the time by my Savior. And should I say in that moment, as I'm being pulled out of the hole, yeah, Lord, I, I'm the one that jumped in here. Give me a few days. We'll connect again, and I'll worship you. That type of mindset is saying that you are equal to God. And what you need to do is clean yourself up so you can be in better relationship with your partner. He's not your partner. He's your God. He's your Savior. Worship him from the get. The best time, I think, to worship God is when we are probably choosing, doing bad things. We know we're not. We pull back, Lord, I worship you. I don't know how to stop this right now, but I know you are God. And I just confess it right now. Help me, Lord. That is a prayer of worship. Confession is worship. Repentance is worship. And not only songs are worship. 
Um, this past week, um, I, I've been in this space for a long time. Like, okay, I want to be a mature Christian. I don't want to just bring the 80 things I need from God all the time. Jesus opened that space for us in the Lord's Prayer. We can petition God, but the power is fine in the adoration. The power is found in adoration. And so I woke up, I don't know, Wednesday morning early, and I thought, and it's not because I want to. I hate waking up early. Amen. Somebody give me an amen to that. Amen. I don't like it. My dad was like, zippity doo da, 5 a.m., no alarm. That's not me, okay? I don't like it. I want that to be on the record. But the Lord wakes me up at that time sometimes, and so I'm thinking, Okay, Lord, I want to adore you right now. I don't, I don't want to, I, w- I don't want to be a little kid Christian. I want to be an adult man Christian. So the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to just ha- like have a conversation with Jesus and make observations about his life. So I'm like, Lord, I, I know that we see you in Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. And I know that we see what are called theophanies of Christ present in the Old Testament over and over again. And then Jesus, I know that you allowed yourself to be born among simple people in a town that nobody had ever heard of to a little, a young lady that people called a whore for years because she was, it was born out of wedlock to a guy that was a carpenter, blue collar, and you had a family. And by 12, you knew fully who you were. And then you disappeared for 18 years. Like Jesus, where were you during that time? You were fully God. We don't know, maybe one day we get to see. And then Jesus at 30, you begin this simple ministry of just telling the truth. All through Mark, all through the Gospels, Jesus says, I am. He doesn't say, well, you know, I'm just a nice guy. I'm just a prophet. He doesn't say that. He says, I am God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That was either heresy or that was either fact. I know it was fact. And then you begin to heal people and you got such a following that you couldn't go into towns after a while and you chose the roughest of people to be your disciples. You didn't choose the educated. You chose the fishermen. You chose dudes that probably had a salty mouth and liked to fight. Obviously they did. And this was your crew for three years and they didn't even believe you half the time and yet you still loved them and showed them mercy And at the end of three years, you allowed yourself to be taken prisoner by men that you knew by name and you knew their parents and you knew their children and you knew their grandparents and you allowed them to whip you, the God of the universe. And then you picked up the cross that they would nail and that's about as far as I could get and I couldn't talk anymore. We are called to adore God. And in that worship state, when we are focused on worshiping, not just lip service and not just listen to a little worship song, but enthralled in our hearts with who he is and what he has done for us. Let me tell you something. Confession is a lot easier. Repentance is a lot easier and change is a lot easier because we are in the presence of the only one that can change us. This is the power of worship. How is this pagan nation's calling different than ours today? It's no different. What these pagans are telling the other pagans to do are the same things that you and I must do today. Let's not complicate it. We have to figure out a way to stop the sin that enslaves us. Okay? We have to figure out a way how to confess it. We have to figure out a way how to worship and then repeat daily. What is the standard? Uh, Is it culture? Must the truth be adjusted because someone doesn't know? This is what church speaks loudly about today. Be, you know, be more kind, be more understanding. You know, a notable top pastor at Easter did not want to share words like crucified and sin and Jesus in their invitation for Easter morning because he didn't want to offend anyone. That's crazy to me. Okay, that's called compromise, all right? The truth is a call to stop sin, confess sin, give glory to God. Isn't that harder than what it sounds like? Like, listen, I'm not up here the one that's won this battle. I struggle every day, but church, let's struggle together. Let's stop lying about it and start being honest about our need. Here's a couple verses, Bible, 2 Chronicles 7.14. 
if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Lord, I, I need help to stop. Lord, I want to change. Lord, forgive me. Scripture says that God heals and hears and forgives. This is your only hope. It's not being a good person. You're not. Neither am I. Psalm 38, psalmist says this, For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. I know that personally, I have felt sorry that I've been caught. I am sorry in moments where somebody holds me accountable. I am sorry when my wife says, hey, but what about that? My response is, oh, she's right. I'm sorry that I'm caught. This is very different. I am sorry for my sin. When we are worshiping a holy God and adoring all his thousands of beautiful, righteous attributes, then we are sorry that we have offended him. And that is a game changer. We are sorry that we have offended the Lord. David says, against you and you only have I sinned. It doesn't mean you don't hurt other people in your sin. It does mean the primary offended person is God when we don't trust him and don't believe him. Finishes up well, though. Revelation 3, 19. John wrote this under the power of God. So this is God speaking to us through John. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So, uh, Guys, if you're being discipled by God right now, which is discipline, by the way, it's correction, it's accountability. He's doing this because he why? He what? He loves you. So be zealous and repent. Here's what God says to you and me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him or her and eat with them and they with me. The one we have cheated on says, I'm at your door. Let me in. Let's sit down and have a meal. The one we have lied about is, I'm at your door. Let me in. I am not angry at you. I love you. I have sent my son to die for you. My mercy is more than you understand. Let's sit down and have a meal together. Let me break bread with you. A lot of us don't even do dinner outside of business because we'd rather do something quick that doesn't hold us to a lot of accountability. So we have coffee, right? We have a Zoom call. And there's nothing wrong with those things. I'm an introvert. I like those things, okay? But there is a value add in sitting down with somebody and having a meal, right? Uh, Selena and I went out with a couple Friday night. No agenda. We just wanted to eat and talk And hang out. The God of the universe says to me and you, the offenders. We are the offenders. He is the offended. And he says, I want to come to your house. I want to to break bread with you. I want to laugh with you. I want to cry with you. The God says that to you and me. That's That's a powerful thing. This is the beginning. When pagans begin to investigate the one true God, most of the time not stopping their own lifestyles, by the way, but beginning to be aware this is good. How do we treat them? What is the protocol when we see people in our circles beginning to change? And uh, a lot of times, y'all, listen, the people that God is going to bring us into contact with, if we're blessed enough to be a part of his work in people's lives, a lot of times they have questions about God and they're still in the middle of the lifestyle. Anybody ever have, had that conversation? And your, your religious mind is like, you need to stop all that and come to Christ right now. Yeah, they do. The fact is most of them don't. Did you? Was there just like this abrupt moment in your life where you're like, everything's changed. No more sin. I'm good now. No, it, it wasn't. It's never happened. Not in my life, not in yours. There's a transition process process. So I want to say this application for those God may be calling and may you be blessed to have people in your life that God is calling that you've been faithful to the Lord and you're working out your stuff with fear and trembling and stumbling and falling over yourself. And you're trying to quit sin. You confess sin and worship God. Here's a few applications. Be a friend, not a foe. Seekers need a guide, not an opponent. 
Stop debating non-Christians. I'm not saying don't stand up for what's right. Sometimes people say things that you have to answer. But do your best to just be their friend, not a compromiser. Now, my, my best guy friend in the world, James Belleville, he's down in the valley. He's a church planner. He's just finished up uh, his uh, divinity degree. Way to go, James. We love you. They're watching right now. Um, when James says to me, I got somebody you want to meet, uh, my response to him is, well, I know I like him. And James will say, we well, haven't met him yet. Yeah, but you're his friend, and I'm your friend, so therefore I'm going to be his friend. All right? Like-minded people. Christian, we know, we know our Savior. His name is Jesus. Has he been good to you? Your call is to introduce people to your friend. Your call is not to save them. You can't. Your call is not to change them. You can't. You just can lead them to the one that can. It's very simple. We complicate it. Number two, speak truth, not emotion. It's up to the Holy Spirit, not you. Christians lean way more into emotion instead of the truth. It is possible to agape love and care for others and tell them the unadulterated truth of the gospel. You know, when your friend blatantly asks you, was well, this thing I'm doing wrong? If it is, you say, yes, it is. It's not my standard. Here's what the word of God. Let me bring you back to my friend. You need to meet the one that created you. It's possible to say that. Here's a third one. And I want you to hear this. Clarify, don't calcify. Some Christians, and I was a recipient of this. They felt like if they just were able to have uh, a clear three hours, they could present to me 87 points why I need to follow Jesus. And it got so boring after a while, I just wanted to walk away. Your responsibility is to clarify. Be the friend that knows the truth. Be the friend that knows your Bible. You don't need to share your preferences. You need to share precepts. Well, Pastor Tom, what about this? Well, hey, let's go to the Word. Let's, let's do some searching. Teach them to investigate what the Bible says, not what you say. Fourth one, explain your struggle. You have not arrived, Christian. You're on the way. You have been saved. You're still on the way. You, you, you've not made it yet. You do not have all the answers. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all quietly are saying, well, I have most of the answers. You actually don't, okay? Um, you are a sinner, saved by grace, but a sinner. Amen? Saved by grace every day, grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, every day. Worship, worship, worship. And the more we worship, what you find out is you're, you're just you're kind of overwhelmed with the rightness of God, and then you're also overwhelmed with the unrighteousness of yourself. That is the right mindset. That's what we're called to have. Um, let this be known. As the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit for discernment. Don't emotionally vomit on anyone. Speak with care, but share your struggle. How do you do that? You're, you're just saturated in prayer every day. Lord, I don't know what to say. Your will be done. Remember Lord's Prayer? Not my will, but your will be done. For yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Holy Spirit knows exactly what you're called to say. This is where we stay in communion. Back to the story. Verse 7. Diviners say this. Now then, prepare one new cart and two milk cows that have never been yoked. When I was a little kid, I'm from the country. We didn't call them milk cows. We called them moo cows. Okay. That's free. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pin them up. Country folk, raise your hand. Who's from the country here? Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, there's very few of us today. Okay. What they do in the spring is they'll separate the, the cows from the calves. And uh, where I was raised, we didn't have air conditioning in our house, so we always kept the windows open. And it sounded like this. Mrrr, mrrr, mrrr. And it didn't just happen for a little bit. And after a while, you're like, shut up, okay? They know one another. So here's, here's what they do. That was for you city folk. Take the ark of the Lord, place it on the cart, and put the gold objects that you're sending uh, Jehovah God as a guilt offering in a box beside the cart. Send it off and let it go its way. Then watch. If it goes up the road to its homeland, 
toward Beth Shemesh. It is the Lord who has made this terrible trouble for us. However, if it doesn't, we will know that it was not by his hand that punished us. It was just something that happened to us by chance. The non-believers are laying out a fleece. The non-believers are showing more wisdom than Israel did by taking the ark to war. They're saying, look, if he is God, then he's going to show us. If he's not, it's not going to matter anyway. Offering is prepared, cart is yoked to cows who are not harness trained, which is a big deal, and have little cow babies. Verse 10, the men did this. They took two milk cows, hitched them to the cart, and confined their calves in the pen. Then they put the ark of the Lord on the cart, along with the box containing the gold mice and the image of their tumors. The cows went straight up the road to Beth Shemesh. They stayed on that one highway, lowing as they went. They never strayed to the right or to the left. And here's what happens also. The Philistine rulers were walking behind them to the territory of Beth Shemesh. Now, Beth Shemesh is a border town. Um, anybody here from Laredo? Sissy, you know what I'm talking about. We were in McAllen, 20 years, border town. Uh, border towns bring out the hardest of both countries. Worldwide, by the way. It's not just like in Texas. It's worldwide that borders are always where there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of issue. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of strife. Beth Shemesh is a border town. They were about probably two miles outside. And these cows that are not yoke trained and, and had their babies right there, head right down the road. And the five leaders of Philistia at that time all walked behind it. And the reason is they want to see what happens because their land is in tumult. Uh, pull up the map. I'll show you. All this began in Shiloh, upper right corner. Okay, this is where Eli and Samuel was raised. Um, capture of the ark happened in Ebenezer when they are in war. This is where the two sons of Eli died and then came back. And when Eli was told, he fell backwards as a judgment died as well. So the ark is captured because they used the ark as a religious artifact to get what they wanted instead of worshiping the God that made the ark. Okay. So seven month tour all the way through Philistia, tumors have broken out. Men, uh, little boys and older men are dying. Uh, mice are running rampant. Disease is going through the country. You go all the way down to Ekron, Ekron to Beth Shemesh, where the ark is recaptured. Maybe about two, two, two miles in a little bit. Okay, you see the departure and the cross from Philistia into Israel from the orange to the yellow. Verse 13, here's what happens. People of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley, and when they looked up and saw the ark, they were overjoyed to see it. They knew what it was. This, this, this is a big deal to them. You're right. They looked up and saw the ark. They were overjoyed to see it. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. I mean, is it, is it a coincidence that the dude's name was Joshua? Yeshua, that's the name of Jesus right there. I think not. Stop near a large rock. The people of the city chopped up the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Like, listen, the response of the people were to worship immediately. They didn't say, maybe we need a round table about this. Let's set up a discussion board. Let's talk to our leaders. Let's just spend some time in thinking about that. They grabbed the cart. They ripped it apart. They made a fire. They bush butchered the cows. Some of y'all have seen butchering. Some of you have not. The blood just does not drip down slowly. It goes everywhere, okay? They butchered these two cows, and they immediately came and sacrificed to God. Immediately. Verse 15, the Levites removed the ark of the Lord along with the box containing the gold objects, placed them on the large rock. That day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. When the five Philistine rulers observed this, they returned to Ekron that same day. So they had been walking probably at a safe distance. This is a border, okay? Um, uh, there's certain towns on the border of Texas and Mexico where you can look into and literally wave to one another on opposing sides. Um, the leaders are walking behind the cart, they watch all this happen. The five leaders are standing there at a distance, probably maybe on their side, and they're watching what's going on. And when they finally see it completed is when they return. Uh, Gat the Ekron was like six miles. Gat the Beth Shemesh like two, um, about seven months for this whole journey. Verse 17, 
As a guilt offering to the Lord, the Philistines had sent back one gold tumor for each city, Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. These are provinces or areas. Um, the fortified cities and the outlying villages. The large rock on which the ark of the Lord was placed is still in the field of Joshua Beth Shemesh today as when this book was written. Now, here next is something interesting, and we'll finish with this today. God struck down the people of Beth Shemesh because they looked inside the ark of the Lord. He struck down 70 persons. People mourned because the Lord struck them with the great slaughter. Now, most of us have not seen one person struck down. Some of us have, but most of us have not seen 70. Like This is a slaughter. Uh, what in the world just happened? The statement that the people say next encapsulates everything. And they say this, who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? What is the answer to that question? The answer is no one. No one. You cannot and I cannot. What is our only hope at present day looking back to this? Our only hope is Jesus Christ. You have nothing to bring to God apart from your worship and salvation in Jesus Christ. There is no gifting that you had that is more powerful than others. You don't activate God in doing anything. God is sovereign. He will do what he chooses to do. His will will never be thwarted or compromised. Kind of health and wealth teaching sometimes goes over in that space. If you do this, God has to do that. No, God doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do. But he is also faithful and merciful and just for people that confess sin and repent and come back to him. His response is, I will forgive you. And I will knock on your door and I will come into your home and we will eat together and I will be your God and you will be my people. So here's what I'll finish today. This is kind of one of our guys from discipleship group mentioned this. This is kind of the life of a Christian. I think we all would like to say when we came to Christ, everything is good now and we're fine. And you are, you're saved. You've been saved eternally and forever. You cannot lose a salvation that was given to you. You did not take salvation. Salvation was given to you. It's a free gift from the Lord. He has sealed you. But this is kind of our process here. First, we want to be willful neglect. We know the truth, but don't obey the truth. That was the Israelites at the beginning of the story. We know that we should just worship God, but let's just throw a religious thing at these people and use God to obtain our own, our own will, and it didn't work. The second one is rejoicing. Uh, confess, repentance, the blessing comes, the ark is returned. This is a good thing, God's blessing. He is present. And what do we do next? We disobey. You disobey and I disobey. Refusing to follow God's instruction. We're just like the Israelites at Beth Shemesh, and we're just like the Philistines. Okay? You and I have been called to do the same thing stop sin, confess it, and worship the living God. Here's where I really will finish, I promise. Eliminate God, and you eliminate guilt. This is what our culture has done, it's what our governmental leaders have done. This is what Hollywood has done. Eliminate this God that is overbearing and you eliminate all your guilt. Establish yourself as God by using phrases like, this is my body, my life. Abortion is women's health. Being trans is just self-expression. And then what you decide is always right. You can come up with your own rules. You can do your own thing outside of the calling and precept of the Bible. And when this happens... Communities break, countries die, and judgment ensues. Christian, here's your call. Stop your sin. Confess your sin. Worship the holy God. Worship him in your need. You will never get better enough to bring yourself into the space of God. Do it now. Worship God today. Begin to focus on God's attributes and his holiness. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart, your mind in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our only hope. Amen? Communion team, come on down.
and we'll sing the doxology in a little bit. Lord, thank you for your word today. We pray it doesn't return void. We are in need of adoring you more, Lord. We are in need of spending time uh, in the Psalms, reading just sentence after sentence that revels in your glory and your perfection and your capacity and your will and your mercy and your justice and your righteousness. We need more time in that space. We thank you, Lord, that as the perfect heavenly father, you do allow us to bring our needs to you um, because you're a good God. But Lord, scripture says you already know them. What you do command us to do, Lord, is to worship you. Teach us how to worship. In your name we pray. Amen. When you're ready, church, come to the center aisle. Uh, receive the bread.